Okay, good evening, everybody. It's 7 o'clock, so we're going to call this meeting to order. Perhaps uh, the person in the back of the room could do me a favor and close the door so we can have a little quiet as we get started. Clerk Aguilar, could you please call the roll? Council Member Aguirre. Here. Council Member Borgens. Here. Council Member G. Here. Council Member Maser. Here. Council Member Siebert. Here. Vice Mayor Howard. Here. And Mayor Bain. Here. We will now go to the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Aguirre. All right, thank you very much, everyone. So this is our State of the City Address, and this is a chance to uh, really focus on the people and the organizations that are having a really positive impact on the community. Uh, this year's theme is People, Our Greatest Asset. And if that theme sounds familiar to you, it's because it's the same theme that we used last year when Councilmember Siebert was mayor. We liked it so much that we wanted to continue it for one more year. And so we're very glad that you were able to join us in person today and welcome to everybody who's watching from home as well. Um, so first of all, what I'd like to do is just, uh, as I look out in the audience, I'd like to see if there are any former mayors here. Is there anyone, a former council member who has represented us? If I see Barbara Pierce in the pack, please stand up, Barbara, so that the audience can recognize you. And then I'd also like to recognize uh, every one of our volunteers who serves on a board committee or commission for the city of Redwood City, as well as any neighborhood chairs who are in the audience. Could you please stand up? Thank, thank you very much. I recognize at least two people who wear both of those hats that we just, that we just called. And then uh, finally, I would like to rec recognize all of our city employees. So if you were an employee of the city of Redwood City, please stand up so we can say thank you. What you're about to hear is our number of highlights. We've put together a video of some key things that have happened over the last year. And I want to point out that all of these things happened because of our staff, so the people that you just recognized. They didn't happen because of us. We're the policymakers, and I think most people don't realize that many of us have full-time jobs outside of serving the city. Our staff's job is to make sure that this city runs smoothly every single day, so thank you very much for that. With that, I would like for us to go right into our highlight reel, so let's roll the video. Would you like to do public comment or the video? Oh, part? I'm sorry. I got so caught up in the moment here. I do have two speakers' cards. Thank you. Uh, the first speaker we have is Clyde Pinto, followed by Brian Jaffe. Mr. Pinto? Sorry. <laughs> Redwood City has been incorporated since 1867, and the YMCA has been a community resource since 1925. So the partnership between YMCA and the city is much appreciated. <clears throat> um, and it will help uh, combine resources and also reduce a lot of costs. Um, the YMCA has about 3,000 members and about 250,000 in financial assistance and programs, uh, subsidies to Redwood City residents every year. Um, <clears throat> I've been a resident in uh, Redwood City for about 14 years and a member in YMCA for about seven years. Uh, my wife, she likes to swim there and I like to do yoga, um, like co core exercise and, I'm sorry, um, a weight training kind of thing. And um, 
the YMC has also many other programs, which um, I, I can mention all of them right now, but um, that's really helpful for the community. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, points that um, were brought up while I, I spoke to membership and were about uh, the park, parking spaces, and uh, I'm not sure exactly how many number of parking spaces were available, but someone was saying about 400 spaces, and the more the better would be good. Uh, the second point was traffic flow. Uh, would preferably be one way with uh, incorporating like smart circulation. Uh, another point was about the size of the front lobby. Um, it, if it, it's allowable, it uh, could be reduced to accommodate more uh, separate rooms um, so because noise level is always a factor when they have classes at YMCA. Um, another point is um, the size of the th theater. Um, should match the attendance. So if there's only a few people attending the theater, there should be less, um, it should be a smaller size theater. Uh, also the size of the promenade should match the usability of the promenade uh, so that you know there's more rooms in the YMCA uh, building. <coughs> also, um, one thing mentioned was that the hot tub and jacuzzi would be a really good addi addition to uh, the plan uh, with the two swimming pools which would uh, help uh, after workout relaxation and would also help the seniors. <clears throat> then um, things like solar panel usage, electric car chargers, uh, you know, Wi-Fi accessibility is welcome and uh, hopefully um, it'll be all, um, it's already part of the plan, but um, would be really appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Pendo. Okay, thank you. Next we have Brian Jaffe. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City staff, and members of the public. My name is Brian Jaffe. I'm a Redwood City resident and the creator of VOCA. Today I'm going to deviate from my normal format. VOCA did ask a question this last week about the pending Harborview project, and I've shared a detailed report with City, city Council and City staff. The Cliff Notes version is that by over a two-to-one ratio, VOCA respondents oppose the project due to concerns about congestion and lack of housing. However, I'd instead like to speak this evening about the theme of your state of the city address, people, our community's greatest asset. My goal when I launched VOCA last summer was to, to bridge the divide that I saw between everyday people and local government. In a world where it's a thousand times easier to say something negative on Facebook than something constructive here in City Hall, I sought a way to bring the desires, concerns, aspirations, and anxieties of everyday people constructively into our local democracy. The very first question I asked on VOCA only had 55 responses. But to me, that was still 30 or 40 more than you would have heard of. Today, over 600 Redwood City residents have signed up for VOCA, and each week, over half share their opinions on issues ranging from development and street design, to child care and affordable housing, to budget priorities and taxes. In other words, hundreds of everyday Redwood City residents are thinking critically and sharing their views with you about the exact same topics you're discussing and deciding in this room. Why am I sharing this? I know that between your revamped neighborhood associations, countless public meetings, and online presence, city government makes great effort to engage with the broader community on your terms, and I applaud this. What I am here to ask is that in addition, you embrace efforts to communicate on our terms. Letters, emails, public speakers, demonstrations, and yes, text messages on VOCA. Sometimes these are the way we want to participate, and I think this should also be given equal value and consideration. In closing, I recognize that public service is a service. It is something each of you do rooted in a desire to improve the community you live in. However, it is not a closed book test. You don't have to discover the answers on your own. In fact, they are generally right in front of you if you're willing to openly listen to what everyday people have to say. Thank you, and I look forward to the address. Thank you, Mr. Jaffe. All right, before we, uh, we roll the video, I'd like to recognize a few other people who are here in the room. Uh, I'd like to recognize Joan Dentler from the office of Senator Jerry Hill. Is Joan still here? Thank you, Joan. I'd like to recognize uh, Mario Rendon from the office of Kevin Mullen. 
and Zach Ross from the office of Mark Berman. So thank you for being here. Okay, with that, let's take a look back at some of the things that have happened over the last year.
So again, I'd like to thank our staff. I'd like to thank the people who worked on the video as well as everybody who made each of those initiatives move forward in the last year. You can see we're doing quite a lot as a city. Uh, we wanted to do it in the form of a video so that we would then have more opportunity to highlight individuals and organizations who are embodying each of those strategic initiatives. So we will start with a community for all ages and that will be led by Councilmember Elise Gary. Thank you, Mayor. It is my pleasure to introduce three people that really um, show what Redwood City is like and what it is like to serve in our community. And so I, I was really fortunate to interview three amazing folks that perhaps we don't see in our everyday um, committees or work that we do in the city or some of the other businesses, but these folks are doing things that are like the unsung heroes. So the first one is Sara Osorio. And Sara told me <clears throat> that she loves helping her community to make it a better place. She is the president of the city's teen advisory board. And through her role, Sarah leads the vision and organization of 20 to, 50, 20 to 25 peers in the teen advisory board's volunteering efforts. And she does this throughout the school year. She also does the including um, Relay for Life, PAL wrapping, beach and community cleanups. And she, one of the things she, Sarah said to me is that many times teens' voices aren't heard. And that being part of TAB, the Teen Advisory uh, Board, is a perfect place because students run the group. They actually organize, they solve the problems in the community, and they're part of the solution. She said for her it's important to set a positive example for her peers and her younger brother and sister, and that her family sacrificed so much for her to be here, and that this is her way of paying it forward. She also plays on Sequoia's varsity and club soccer teams and is the president of the Echoes Environmental Club at Sequoia High School. She's an immigrant, and she came when she was very young. She's the first person in her family to graduate from high school. She's a dreamer. She will be the first one in her family to attend college and plans to study nursing to help immigrants. And she plans to attend CSU Stanislaus. Sarah, and I know you're here, so if you could stand up and we could see you. Thank you for all you do, Sarah. The next young lady that I'm going to introduce is Tammy Herrera. And Tammy is from Guatemala. She's a participant with the city's Fair Oaks Adult Activity Center, and she's also a volunteer for the Fair Oaks Information and Referral Program. She has volunteered for over 15 years in the monthly Family Harvest Food Distribution Program at Fair Oaks. She works in the garden at the Senior Center every Friday. Tammy volunteers at the annual Toy and Book Drive for distribution during Christmas. She also volunteers for the Mexican Mobile Consulate and helps out immigrants from Guatemala and Honduras. And she also helps DACA students. The last thing she said to me is, I help Terry, I help Terry anytime she needs anything. So Tammy, would you please stand up so we can highlight you and thank you. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Diego Garcia Abram. And Diego is a shining example of resiliency and success, as well as dedication of giving back to the community. His story of community began about 15 years ago when he was in first grade at Fair Oaks Elementary School. He was a participant as a learner in the Project's READ program, and he was there for four years. And he told me he remembers that his tutors, Jessica and Yesenia, how they helped him to read and learn new words and vocabulary. He went on to McKinley School and then Everest Public High School. And while he was at Everest, he had the opportunity to give back to his community. And he didn't even think of it twice. He said, I was a learner. Now I can be the one that's going to be giving back. And so he's been a tutor at the Project Read. Um, and he graduated from Everest Public High School in 2016. He's currently at Foothill College. And he's on his uh, way to transfer to the university in 2019. So um, several months ago, despite his dedication to his coursework, Diego reached out to Project Read, again offering to tutor the youth in his program in the evenings when he was not at Foothill. He explained that he sees Project Read as an extension of his community, as several of his nieces and families and friends are his current students. He further explains that he believes that if he had not participated in Project Read as an elementary student, his life would have been a lot different. He is committed to helping youth in his community receive the supportive mentoring that was valuable to him, 
and he has now joined the Project Reed staff in order to help pay for his college and transfer to the university and deepen his commitment to serving his community. Diego, would you please stand up? Is he here? There you are. <laughs> So I was so lucky to be able to meet these three amazing individuals that are really the faces of our community. Thank you all for what you do, the three of you. Over to Shelley. Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations to all of you guys for being here instead of watching the Warriors game. So <laughs> we'll get you out. Um, you know, it's, it's so great to be able to do our state of the city this way because, as we all know, building a great community together is multifaceted work, and the priorities we've set as a council reflect that. The individuals that impact our priorities are numerous. They're from my colleagues here on the dais, our city staff who do the work every day, to community members who step up and take a leadership role that reflects their commitment to a great community. You've just heard about some really amazing people who are making a difference every day, and we all owe them a debt of gratitude, but I'm pleased to share with you a few more. So as you may know, or may not, um, our council has placed a high priority in our committee on community building and communication. It's reflected in our overall mission statement and how we try to do our work each day. The revitalization of our neighborhood associations has been a significant component of that commitment. We have so many active associations right now um, some of them brand new, some of them very well established. I think you saw it in the video, 17 in all. And before I share a story about three of them, I really need to give a huge shout out and thank you to Alex Kajikian. Alex is our um, deputy city manager who's been supporting the neighborhood associations in a variety of ways. And even though he has small children, Alex is out many nights of the week attending meetings, representing us, and helping our neighborhoods with their challenges. So can you all help me thank Alex really quick? <laughs> all righty. So our newest neighborhood association, no surprise, is our downtown neighborhood association. It's spearheaded by our Redwood City native, Jason Galisadas. Jason, can you stand up for a sec? Jason went through Redwood City Schools, and he moved back home to Redwood City, I think, about two years ago, right? Um, and he jumped right back into his community, giving back as uh, his parents taught him. Uh, the Downtown Neighborhood Association kicked off its efforts November of last year with a mixer that drew over 50 attendees. It represents primarily some of our um, city's newest residents. And uh, their uh, mission is it seeks to build connections in the downtown community, to serve as a conduit between the downtown community and the city of Redwood City, and to give back to Redwood City as a whole. Some of the key priorities of the downtown residents include establishing a downtown park, which as you can see we're working on, improving transportation and mobility, which you can also hopefully saw in our video we're working on, and supporting robust retail options downtown, which we are also working on. So we're excited that our missions align there. Uh, the Neighborhood Association meets the second Thursday of the month, right? Usually? Every other month. Um, and tends to alternate between business and social activities. So if you didn't join us last week at Cyclismo, I encourage you to go next time. It's super fun. On the other end of the spectrum is the Redwood Shores Community Association. It's currently headed by Sue Nix. Sue couldn't be here tonight because she has taken a rare trip out of town, um, which we are happy she's able to do, and she told me she's actually going on a vacation. So if you know Sue, you know that's unusual for her. So while we wish we could recognize her in person, we're happy that she's having a little bit of time to herself. After 32 years in the shores and 10 years on the board of the association, Sue knows what it takes to have an effective and vibrant neighborhood association. Their monthly newsletter, The Pilot, which currently reaches about 6,000 people, has been going out to neighbors for 50 years. She describes a time when it was dittoed, stapled, and hand-delivered. Some of you in this audience I know remember dittoes. Some of you do not. Um, and if you've seen it recently, it's really come a long way. It's uh, got excellent design, wonderful news, and even has ads to help support it. And since they believe that a uh, Robot Shores Association believes that a big part of their role is communication, they also have included signboards in the shores. If you drive out there, you'll see them. Um, and they have an email blast that they send out to about 1,500 people. 
Sue feels strongly that the neighborhood wouldn't be as nice without the association. They've advocated to have a fire station, a library, schools, and levees. All of it worked. Uh, they see themselves as a connection to the city for the residents and a place for people to go in the shores. I also want to note that Sue talked a, quite a bit about how much she appreci appreciates her relationship with the police department, parks and rec, um, and public works and fire. So thank you guys all for your great work um, with the Redwood Shores Community Association. Now just in the middle, just right, is the Friendly Acres Neighborhood Association. It's chaired by Bonnie Miller, and I saw Bonnie a few minutes ago. Where are you, Bonnie? Just, can you just stand up so people can see you? <laughs> Bonnie also chairs our Housing and Human Concerns Commission because she didn't have enough to do chairing a neighborhood association. Bonnie told me that she was tricked into chairing her association uh, when the city was at another time revitalizing its neighborhood associations in 1989. So Bonnie's been the chair of that neighborhood association since 1989. She told me she's had four to five different co-chairs. And uh, the second co-chair, she spent so much time advocating for her neighborhood, people thought they were married. <laughs> <laughs> she did tell me one of their big wins also resulted in cost savings for our city. The city was retrofitting the fire stations for earthquake safety. And Bonnie and her co-chair did some calculations. And they discovered that they if they built a new fire station, which as a bonus didn't flood when it rained, um, would actually be $11,000 cheaper. So armed with this back, they went to the city council and advocated for their new fire station. Station 11 was rebuilt and continues to serve the Friendly Acres neighborhood. The Friendly Acres Neighborhood Association was the first to do disaster preparedness training and continues to maintain their container, which holds just a little bit of factual information. This is where you would need to be in a case of an emergency. Nine 55 gallon drums of water, food for three days for 100 people, flashlights and radios. And they're such a good partner, they've also given a key to the school um, so that if, the, if they're not around and the school needs to get into that container, they can also access the supplies. This association also worked to get the uh, Police Activities League building in their neighborhood so that they had a place to meet. Bonnie feels that associations can do a great service by working on issues and sh that affect them and sharing them with the city council. With an open door, the Friendly Acres Neighborhood Association, which one of my colleagues is also a member of, and I won't share the story about your, um, your uh, pretending to have a radar gun. Well, actually, I am going to share this story. Apparently, my council member colleague, before she was on council, when they ha were having a lot of traffic problems, I took her hair dryer out there and pretended to have a radar gun. <laughs> But she slowed the traffic down, and that's the kind of action that the Friendly Neighbors, <laughs> a Friendly Acres Neighborhood Association takes. Just in case you're curious, um, they believe that we all have to work together to make our community great. And they work to ensure that everyone who attends their meetings feels like it counts for, for them to attend. So thank you so much. We're so lucky to have such committed neighborhood leaders who all believe in community, advocacy, and neighborliness. All right, now I'm switching gears, uh, almost literally, um, to talk about another group of community members. Thanks for keeping up with me, since I didn't give you my talking points in advance. <laughs> um, who are making a difference, not just in Redwood City, but in our region, the Boardwalk Auto Mall. So where's the Boardwalk Auto Mall team? Are you guys here? They were going to try and make it. Uh, must have had too many extra cars to sell. Um, as you all know, the council's identified economic development as a priority. And for us in Road City, that means to develop and sustain a thriving local business environment that contributes to the community's economic well-being and quality of life. Now I look at two aspects of that definition. The thriving local business environment contributes to our tax base and revenues, enabling us to provide services like police and fire for our residents. Car dealerships are a significant source of sales tax revenue and as such important to our city. But I also think about quality of life beyond our economic well-being, how we protect our environment and contribute to clean air and water. That's why Jamie Kopf and the Boardwalk Auto Team are my choice to highlight. They not only contribute to our economic vitality, but they've also gone to great lengths to reduce their energy consumption, recycle products, and protect the environment from hazardous materials. Boardwalk Auto Mall, whose brands include Chevrolet, Nissan, Volkswagen, Lotus, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, and Chrysler, covered a wide range there, is Northern California's greenest car dealer. 
Starting with the sales of the electric Nissan Leaf, they have risen to become the number one Leaf dealer in the U.S. Um, a quote from Jamie is, after we started selling the Leaf, we thought, why stop there? Let's keep it going. Working with PG&E, the Boardwalk Auto Mall has reduced their lighting energy uses, usage by nearly 90%. A contributing factor has been their conversion to LED exterior lighting. They were one of the first automotive facilities to make this conversion. They also partnered with fellow Redwood City dealers Town Ford and Hopkins Acura to install 1,200 solar panels, the largest endeavor of its kind on the peninsula. And they've also installed a 50,000 um, photovoltaic project to charge their electric vehicles with sun power. And they're currently permitting for an additional 35,000, as well as they're planning to install additional 24-hour uh, charging stations for all electric vehicles. But they haven't stopped there. They've built their facility with clean environmental, um, fo with a clean environmental focus. They have no in-ground lifts, no in-ground storage tanks, and all their underground piping is done in PVC so that they can reduce the risk of soil and groundwater contamination. They do full materials recycle on site, and they say cardboard is their biggest package recycling. When I contacted Jamie to let him know that we would be recognizing their efforts, he said, our team has always been very conscious of the environment and have tried to leave as little footprint as possible. We are so grateful to the Boardwalk team for all their efforts to keep our community and our region green and healthy. So thank them. Can you help me thank them even though they're not here? Maybe they'll watch. And now I'm pleased to turn the mic over to my colleague, Councilmember G. Thank you, Councilmember Mazur. Government operations. You know, it, it may not sound too exciting, but as Mayor Bain started his comments earlier, we have a number of team members that are not only with us here tonight, but are here within our city every single day. And it's our Redwood City team members. They're our front line. The boots on the ground, interacting with our residents every day. Whether it be a sewer project, mowing the lawns, making sure there's toilet paper in the restroom, or filling a pothole, these are the people that take care of our city our community's greatest asset. For the next few minutes, I hope I can provide some great examples of how our city team members make a difference every day. As council, we've learned how important a minute or two is in our busy lives. For example, when Melissa was on her way to work when she needed to drop off her children at daycare. On this day, our sewer crew was working on Faye Street and the crew was blocking the driveway in which she wanted to drop off her children. Immediately, Ben, Chad, Tally, and Sergio of our city crew stopped what they were doing, moved their equipment, and made a safe path for them to get her kids to the daycare. Melissa herself is involved with construction, and she understands how inconvenient an interruption like this one can be, but the professionalism of our team members, kindness and understanding was greatly appreciated. I'd like to introduce you now to Jessica and her daughter, Charlotte. I don't know if Jessica was able to make it tonight. Jessica, it's great to see you. Did Charlotte make it? Oh, yes, there she is. Great. Jessica, Jessica is currently a stay-at-home mom. As someone who is not a library goer, they have discovered the programs at the library. The programs are a lifesaver. The programs at the library expose her daughter to a wide range of learning opportunities, including cultural, languages, arts, crafts, STEM, and song. When Charlotte goes to song time and listens to a song in Spanish, she sings it on her way home. Miss Leslie's book recommendations are right on target. They are perfect for her daughter and exposes her to Spanish. She is one of Charlotte's favorite teachers. Through Miss Leslie's STEM class, a class that Miss Leslie obtained a grant for and created curriculum, she captivates a class of 20 kids, all under the age of five, and exposes them to science that they can understand. For example, Jessica and her family just returned from a trip to Disneyland, and her daughter started naming the primary colors that she learned from Miss Leslie's class. Arts and crafts in Miss Pam's class on Wednesday, after school and before dinner, is a treat. Then, of course, I can't forget about Daffy Dave, every Tuesday, 3 o'clock, at the Shaberg Library. Disneyland can be a lot of fun, and when they want, went on It's a Small World, Charlotte yelled out, this is the song that Daffy Dave sings. <laughs> Walt Disney is smiling. 
The programs at the library are having tremendous impact on the growth development of her daughter, but it's more than that. The children and the parents are building a network of friends. They're creating experiences that they will remember. It's not the buildings, the collections, or the reference materials in the library. Sorry, Derek. No. It's the impact of Miss Leslie, Miss Pam, and Daffy Dave that are helping Jessica, Charlotte, and the other children and parents create a community. So thank you. And the last story I'd like to share involves Jose, Carlos, Jesus, Francisco, Mike, Mark, and 3,225. City Trees is a River City nonprofit organization that is comprised of volunteers. Without the partnership of Redwood City and the staff of Public Works and Parks, Recreation, and Community Services, it might be safe to say that there would not be 3,225 trees planted since 2000. This partnership would help City Trees plant an average of 100, 180 trees a year. Our team helps identify planting sites in the city, letting neighbors know that the planting is planned and lovingly what we call door knocking, letting the neighbors know there's trees coming and if you would like, if you could sign an agreement to help water the newly planted trees, buying the trees at wholesale prices, storing the trees until planting day, making arrangements for having the underground utilities marked and located. If a large tree is being planted, getting the right equipment to help dig that hole, making sure the trees are delivered. If you're in the median, doing traffic control, watering the trees if needed, and making sure that when they do prune and pub, and I did make sure those words were in the right order, uh, the pruning's cleaned up after the, uh, before they head to the pub so that they, um, <clears throat> there's not a big mess left behind. By the way, City Trace has just started their prune and pub series. Their first session was May 10th. Uh, they do that from May to August. So if you want to take a lesson in pruning, followed by the pub part, you can find them on Facebook. There are other volunteer tree planting organizations in other cities. One of our, the board members, Jess, and one who works for Davy Trees, one day pulled Mark Canfield, our city arborist aside, said Mike Gibbons is going above and beyond. Mike's doing things he doesn't have to do. He is making stuff happen. So Sims, I know you're here, and I think Nancy, anyone else with City Trees, please rise and, and be recognized. <laughs> 3,225, that's a huge number with many more to come, so thank you. Making stuff happen, engaging our residents, our businesses and visitors is a responsibility that everyone that works for the city understands. However, it's all about our people. It's people like, I hope I get these names right, Ben Fennec, Chad Catano, Tally Tao, Sergio Rodriguez Galvan, Miss Leslie, Miss Pam, Daffy Dave, Jose, Laura, Jose Larios, Carlos Tobar, Jesus Angel, Francisco Espinoza, Mike Gibbons, and Mark Canfield. And the many, many other team members in Redwood City that make it happen are people, and our community's greatest asset. I want to thank Melissa, Jessica, and your daughter Charlotte, Sims, and the rest of the board at City Trees for allowing me to share your stories tonight. Now I'd like to pass the presentation over to Councilmember Borgens. Good evening. I get to celebrate tonight housing. And when I accepted this challenge, I didn't realize what a challenge it would be. And I myself have learned a lot through preparing for tonight's presentation. So let me start by saying affording a home in Redwood City and the broader Bay Area is becoming increasingly more challenging. Achieving housing security for all in the community is a focus for the city and why this city council recently approved several goals to help address this regional issue. We are all connected. What happens to one part of the community impacts us all. Safe and affordable housing is important to our well-being. For parents with families, housing means good schools, a quality education, and successful futures for their children. For working professionals, housing close to your job means more living and less commuting. For those retired with adult children, affordable housing means that your children can have children and live close by. 
Producing and preserving affordable homes is a good investment in our community's future. The city works to produce and preserve affordable homes in several ways, including adopting policies and programs to generate permanent fund sources, investing in new construction of affordable housing, acquisition and rehabilitation of existing apartment buildings, and measures to provide renters with greater stability. One recent innovative effort to preserve existing affordable housing in our community, including facil facilitating Stanford University's donation of $1 million to St. Francis Center to purchase an apartment building located at 780 Bradford Street in downtown Redwood City. This 25-unit building is occupied by low-income households that will not be displaced and will be able to pay rents that are affordable to them. Stanford's recent donation will preserve it as affordable rental housing for years to come. The major hurdle when creating affordable housing is the overall cost, especially the land and construction costs. This is true both for the development of new housing and when preserving existing homes. To help solve this problem, the city recently approved requirements that will generate funding for affordable housing in the future. With these challenges in mind, on March 26, the City Council approved ordinances to require minimal rental lease terms and relocation assistance for low-income tenants and rental properties with three or more units in Redwood City. The City has achieved many recent successful accomplishments and it is actively engaged in working with the community, community to continue to identify short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions that will increase the supply of affordable housing and preserve existing affordable housing. So what are we doing? I'm going to highlight some of our policy programs and partnerships. Permanent fund sources, generating funding for affordable housing through short-term rentals. The City Council recently held a public hearing, took initial steps to regulate short-term rentals, Airbnb and others, and dedicate the Transparency Tax, Hotel Tax, TOT. Revenue generated to the city's affordable housing fund. Redwood City is the first community in the region to dedicate taxes generated by short-term housing to support affordable housing. Housing developers pay fees to help create new affordable housing in our community. The city council also approved affordable housing impact fees to help pay for the creation of new affordable housing. This action requires new residential and commercial developments in our community to pay fees to support the production of affordable housing. The estimated affordable housing impact fees generated from developers dedicated to affordable housing are approximately $5 million in 2018. This funding is set aside in the affordable housing fund. Other housing fund sources. Weber City voters adopted utility users tax in 1988. A portion of this tax is used for affordable housing. The city receives federal community development block grants, CDBG, and home investment partnership, home grants, each year. And we just awarded over a million dollars of these funds to support affordable housing production and preservation programs. I want to take this moment to thank the Housing, Humans, and Concern Committee for all their work that they did to allocate these funds to needy organizations. Creating and preserving of affordable housing. The City of River City offers a number of programs and services to support for all income levels. The City helps residents locate affordable housing, keeps homes affordable through housing rehabilitation grants and programs, and continually looks for ways to create new affordable housing. To date, the City of River City has produced almost 900 units in below market rate housing, including rental and ownership units. All of the units are deed restricted as affordable for 30 to 55 years. Rubber City has assisted with the rehabilitation of 2,800 homes owned or owner occupied by low income residents. As a result of the city's new housing impact fees, some developers have opted to provide affordable units rather than pay the fee, which is an accept acceptable alternative. This alternative has already produced affordable units and more are approved and under construction. Policies and initiatives. The city has adopted a number of policies and initiatives to help produce and preserve affordable housing. New affordable housing requirements for density bonus update. Amended the downtown precise plan to reserve units for affordable housing. Affordable housing development on city-owned Bradford site. 
adoption of affordable housing impact fees and increased flexibility to add accessory dwelling units. Partnerships. The city has engaged in many successful collaboration with community partners, including HART, the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust of San Mateo County. The city is a member agency of this organization that was formed in 2003 as a public-private partnership among the cities, the county, and the businesses, nonprofit education, and labor communities to create more affordable housing opportunities in San Mateo County. HART meets critical housing needs in San Mateo County by raising both public and private funds. Recently, they have been focusing on the development of affordable housing for teachers. As we have seen with the Kenyatta College project, teacher and staff housing, this model works to help recruit and retain our teachers in this difficult housing market. Mid-Penn Housing Corporation, one of the nation's leading nonprofit developers, owners, and managers of high-quality affordable housing. HIP Housing works to improve the housing and lives of people in our community by enabling people with special needs, rather, if either from income or circumstance, that's rolling on me, with special needs, either from income or circumstance, to live independent, self-sufficient lives in decent, safe, low-cost homes. And Habitat for Humanity works to provide affordable home ownership opportunities to very low-income households. Two special projects I would like to highlight tonight, Mid-Pen Housing and HIP Housing. Mid-Pen Housing, 3752 to 3770 Rollison Road is a 55-unit apartment complex now owned by Mid-Pen Housing. The city invested $1.1 million of its affordable housing funds generated from housing impact fees to help prevent the displacement of 55 extremely low and very low income households that currently occupy these units. Midpen is renovating these apartments that were severely neglected, which will improve the health and safety of the tenants. The city's investment <clears throat> will also preserve the affordable rents for these units for 55 years. Hip housing. HIP Housing successfully runs many programs to enable people with special needs, either from income or circumstance, to live independent, self-sufficient lives in decent, safe, low-cost homes. Their primary programs include home sharing, self-sufficiency, self and affordable housing development. The City Council approved over $1.5 million from its new affordable housing funds from revenue generated from its housing impact fees to provide HIP housing the ability to acquire an existing apartment building. The HIP home sharing program. HIP housing also operates a home sharing program that matches low income people seeking affordable housing with people that have a home to share. In some cases, both the housing seeker and the housing provider are low income. The city funds to HIP housing help support the home sharing program. Tonight, I would like to share a home sharing success story. Rich Shabaro, and Rich is here with us tonight. Rich, would you please stand for a moment so we can recognize you? Thank you. I'm gonna share Rich's story. Rich is a senior, a Vietnam veteran, and has worked through the Redwood City Parks and Recreation Department for 27 years as an assistant league director for adult sports and as a field supervisor. In 2013, the roommate he lived with in Redwood City passed away and Rich was given a two week notice to move. The Park and Recreation Department told him about HIP housing sharing program and within a few weeks of applying, he was able to move in with a housemate in Redwood City who had a two bedroom home to share. A year or so later, Rich had to have a full knee replacement and unfortunately wasn't eligible for disability income. He became concerned about not being able to meet the rent for the month he was unable to work. Rich contacted HIP Housing for support and one of their donors helped supplement his rent for the month that he was unable to work. Rich knows the challenges people face to find affordable housing up and down the peninsula, especially veterans. 27,000 for 2,700 for a one bedroom apartment is out of reach for many. So it's 27,000. 
<laughs> and for someone like him who works part-time, coming up with revenue to afford housing is a challenge, especially when disability benefits are often denied. It's been five years now, and Rich and his housemate have been home sharing in Redwood City. Home sharing has helped him solidify a place to hang his hat each night, knowing that he doesn't have to worry about finding a new place to live and coming up with rent that is beyond his reach. Rich, thank you for your service to our country, and thank you for being here tonight and allowing me to share your story of a great example of the variety of ways the city and hip housing, thank you, Kate Condehar Hart, for being here, partner together to find affordable housing solutions. In closing, our community housing in our future. Beginning this past March, the city in partnership with Redwood City 2020, the city's Home for All initiative, and the Library Foundation is inviting the community to come together <coughs> for a series <coughs> of community conversations on housing. Our community, housing, and our future includes a series of community conversations and city council meeting discussions. Please, please consider joining us for one or all of these opportunities to discuss the important issues facing our community. These conversations will include community input on development of affordable housing fund guidelines generated from housing impact fees. I would like to invite the community to attend our next community conversation on housing, May 22nd, 7 p.m. PM at the Veterans Memorial Senior Center, or go to the redwoodcity.org website for more information. So how are we doing? Have we found a nirvana when it comes to providing housing for all our people? Probably not quite. Are we working hard to retain and create new housing opportunities? Absolutely. River City will continue to preserve the housing diversity of our community, but continue to provide housing opportunities for all. Those who live here, those who want to live here, and those who want to stay here. I welcome you to join the conversations and help us tackle this difficult, difficult issue before our community and all communities. We welcome you to the table. I now would like to pass it on to Council Member Howard. Thank you, Council Member Borgens. A Bengali author wrote these words more than a hundred years ago. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. Today I'm going to tell you about three groups of people, mostly volunteers, who provide unique services to our community and because of them, our city is a safer place to live. The first is the Volunteers and Policing Program. This program is made up of a diverse group of community members with a wide variety of backgrounds, from students and aspiring police officers to tech company executives and Stanford academics, all of whom donate their time to make Redwood City a better and safer place to live and work. The group meets monthly to train, plan their events and activities, and enjoy each other's company. The Volunteers in Policing, or VIPs, provide crucial support to the police department at a wide variety of events, and by doing this, keep our officers available to respond to critical incidents and emergencies. As a group, they donate over 2,000 hours of volunteer time to the city each year, and it is no exaggeration that many of the events the department is able to participate in would not be possible without the support of the VIPs. They are led by Simon Streets and Tony Rogers, both of whom have full-time corporate jobs. Over the past five years, the group has become a more integral part of our police department and has their own vehicle, vests, flashlights, and radios, all to better support the police department at different events. Some of the diverse activities they have supported include music on the square, music in the park, Bethlehem AD, Neighborhood Watch, Downtown Festivals, the Port Festival, Fair Oaks Community Day, the Fourth of July Parade and Fireworks Show, Hometown Holidays, the Citizens Police Academy, fingerprinting children for the missing person protocol, 
and special details such as presidential and VIP visits, and the list goes on. At these events, they often arrive early for setup and stay late for cleanup. They provide traffic control, hand out department literature, engage with the community, and most importantly, provide those extra eyes and ears that make our police department more efficient and our community safer. The VIPs are an integral part of public safety in Redwood City and a valuable asset to the community. Since its inception in 2005, the total volunteer hours exceeded 54,000, with over 8,000 hours this past year. There are now 21 members, so some quick math will tell you that is over 400 hours per member last year. These volunteers provide the community with an inviting, supportive, and caring face for our police department. And in the words of Captain Streets, the Redwood City Police Department VIP organization is filled with volunteers who have heart, who love Redwood City, and give whenever they are able. The VIPs have and continue to grow our efforts to provide the community with an inviting, supportive, and caring face for our police department. It is volunteer programs like this that Tony and I believe help make Redwood City not only the best climate by government test, but one of the best cities to live and thrive. I'd like to ask members of our Redwood City Police Department and our volunteers in policing to please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much for being here tonight. The second group are our CPR trainers. In 2016, Assembly Bill 1719 mandated that cardiopulmonary resuscitation, more commonly known as CPR training, would be accomplished for all high school students by 2018. However, the Sequoia Union High School District has been partnering with the Sequoia Healthcare District, Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital, and our fire department in providing CPR training to students since 2012. Once again, Redwood City leads the way. Over 8,000 students have now received CPR training. Back in the fall of 2012, Dr. Karen Lee, wellness coordinator for the Sequoia Union High School District, and Mr. Glenn Nielsen, director of the Sequoia Healthcare District's Heart Safe program were inspired by a teacher, Laura Perdicomatis Woodside High program that teaches CPR to freshmen during their phys ed classes. Dr. Lee and Mr. Nielsen invited local firefighters to assist in the teaching of the American Heart Association's hands-only and AED or automated external defibrillator curriculum to all district freshmen. In addition to our firefighters, volunteers from the community and staff from organizations such as Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital and Via Heart Project offer to assist in these training, which take place annually throughout the school year. This has been an extremely rewarding project, and the CPR team is looking forward to training future incoming freshmen. Has the training yielded good results, you ask? I am so pleased to share this story with you. Last fall, a Woodside High School student saved the life of his classmate. Teacher Rich Modolewski had just taught CPR, AED use, and the Heimlich maneuver to his phys ed class. That same day at lunchtime, freshman Umberto Villalobos started choking, and his classmate, Oriel Oropesa Herrera quickly dislodged the food from Humberto's throat by using his newfound knowledge of the Heimlich maneuver. Oriel is a true hero. On November 4th last year, a heart screening, a free heart screening clinic was held at Sequoia High School, where 621 students were screened and four were found to have cardiac anomalies that required a visit, a visit to a cardiologist. For any of you who are interested, Sequoia Healthcare District offers free CPR training at their Redwood City office. I'd like to invite 
all members of the CPR team, Sequoia Healthcare District, Dig Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital, and the fire department, all part of the team, to please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Our third group is our Redwood City School Crossing Guards. Our Redwood City Crossing Guards provide a vital service to our community and help to keep our most precious resource, our children, safe as they go to and from school. Crossing Guards are well trained and show up to work rain or shine each and every school day throughout the year. The guards serving Redwood City staff 21 separate posts serving Redwood City schools in both the Redwood City Elementary School District and the Belmont Redwood Shores School Districts. They provide over 10,000 hours of service each year, and all our school crossing guards are our retired men and women of the community. The crossing guards provide much needed support to the police department's field personnel and allow them to focus their efforts on traffic enforcement and other activities that promote public safety. This is no easy job, as the guards must deal with increasingly harried, hurried, and distracted drivers, while at the same time making sure the children are following direction, waiting for the appropriate time to cross, and obeying the rules of the road. A while back, a crossing guard brought a video to our council meeting showing some of the close calls on Farm Hill Boulevard caused by drivers in a rush. This video was instrumental in bringing about the installation of better traffic calming measures on Farm Hill Boulevard. Their efforts do not go unnoticed by our community. The parents and the children, who on a daily basis are guided safely across busy streets, often show their appreciation by giving cookies and candies to the guards on their birthdays and on holidays. In Redwood Shores, Ray Robinson worked as a crossing guard on the corner of Bridge Parkway and Bowsprit for almost 16 years. During that time, Ray never missed even a single day of work. Last year, he passed away, and over 70 Redwood Shores residents wanted to show their appreciation for Ray and his service to their families. They donated funds for seven trees, a boulder with a plaque, and held a memorial service for him at the site where he worked each school day. In finishing, I wanted to add that in addition to making our children get safely across busy rush hour roadways, a guard plays another very important function as a role model, helping children develop the skills necessary to cross streets safely at all times. These unsung heroes deserve our respect and our thanks. They play a critical role in keeping our community safe, and I hope you'll wave to them as you go by and stop and slow down every time you see a crossing guard just to be sure that you keep everyone safe. I'd like to ask our city crossing guards to please stand and be recognized. I know they couldn't all be here. Tonight I have highlighted just three service volunteer groups who unselfishly give of their most precious resource, their time, for the betterment of our community. Hopefully these stories will inspire you to want to get more involved in your community, in our community. If you would like to know more about how you can get involved, or even perhaps become a VIP volunteer, a CPR volunteer, or a school crossing guard, please go to our city website, www.redwoodcity.org, and click on Volunteer Opportunities. My thanks to these three wonderful organizations who serve our community so well. It's been an honor to speak about you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Council Member John Siebert. Thank you, Vice Mayor Howard. So before I get started tonight, by a show of hands, how many of you got here tonight on your own without the help of anyone else? Or could have gotten here tonight without the help of anyone else? Most people in the audience got here tonight. 
If you're like me, you take getting around Redwood City for granted. I head out to pick, out a few pick up a few last minute groceries. I run a quick errand, head to an appointment, doctor's appointment, or meet some friends at one of my favorite restaurants downtown, or of course on Monday nights, attend city council meetings whenever we meet. I'm sure that's very high on most people's priority. And while we may face traffic along the way or difficulty finding just the right parking space or wonder why sometimes weather best by government test doesn't seem to be true as the rain soaks the roads during the wintertime, the reality is that most of us freely get around our community without having to worry too much about how we're going to get somewhere when we want to or simply when we need to. And yet our community is full of people, many elderly or disabled, who don't enjoy the same freedom of mobility that we do. For those people, the world can be a very small and confined area that includes their homes, yards, or if they're very fortunate, a nearby store that they can walk to. Imagine in your community how much you could get to if you only had to walk or rely on others. So who serves this needs? Certainly family and friends that may be available are there to help at times when it's convenient for them. But there's an organization in our community that, until I went to work for Samtrans about a year ago, I never realized played such an important role in giving people in our community a taste of the same freedom of mobility that most of us enjoy. The people of Samtrans' paratransit through wet Ready Wheels. Ready Wheels serves persons with disabilities who cannot independently and freely get around our community. On a prearranged basis, service is provided throughout San Mateo County, and caregivers may accompany them for free. Although Ready Wheels service doesn't provide its riders the same freedom we all enjoy, this vitally important service provides safe, reliable transportation to those who so desperately need it. I spoke recently with Tina Dubost, Manager of Accessible Transit Services at Sam Trans, about Ready Wheels, and she shared with me some amazing statistics. Ready Wheels serves over 8,000 eligible riders at any given time. A whopping 900 of them live right here in Redwood City. This next statistic was staggering. In March 2018 alone, just, two, just a month and a half ago, Ready Wheels provided almost 27,000 trips to riders. 5,400 of those trips had a Redwood City connection. All that and boasting a better than 90% on time record. I get myself around and I don't even think I'm on time 90% of the time. Like Redwood City, Ready, Ready Wheels' greatest asset is their people. And Ms. Dubo showed a couple of touching stories. There was the driver who not only was busy fulfilling their duties of providing trips to people in a safe and timely manner, but recently was called upon in an emergency medical situation and whom, with the help of the Ready Wheels dispatch, was able to assist in saving a person's life. And the client who recently shared with Ready Wheels that she uses the service to visit her husband of many, many years as he was recently and now living in a care facility she shared that she would have no possible way to see the man she loves without the service of Ready Wheels. And that brings me to why people ride Ready Wheels. Whereas the top reasons are for medical care and routine errands, I love the fact that the service is providing people life-giving social connections, including visiting family, friends, attending religious services, taking part in senior adult activities, shopping, getting their hair and nails done, and eating a meal at one of their favorite rest restaurants. All the things that we take for granted being able to do. As always, it takes everyone in a community lending a hand to truly be a great community. So what role can we all play in making sure Ready Wheels is there for the future to ensure everyone enjoys the personal mobility that we enjoy? Here are three quick ways that we, all of us can help. One, tell people about Ready Wheels. Let people know it's available to those who need it. Two, if you know someone that would make a great driver or reservationist, have them apply. There's a sign at the Ready Wheels facility on 934 Brewster Avenue, if I didn't know that exactly. Um, Redwood's Ready Wheels is always looking for great people uh, to join their team. And in November, support the Get Us Moving initiative that will provide critical funds protected from anything but local usage for transportation in our communities. 
So unfortunately, the people that I talked about tonight, those that rely on ready wheels, couldn't be here tonight. Uh, they couldn't get, uh, it, it, they would have required them to get on a ready wheels and get down here for this meeting. But what's interesting about the group that couldn't be here tonight is they're counting on each one of us to be there for them, uh, to be there in support of the things that they need desperately so that they can enjoy the freedom of this community, of this great community, uh, and all the, the things that it has to offer for them. So thank you, and I'm happy tonight to turn it over to, uh, Vice, uh, to Mayor Bain. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Councilmember Siebert, and all of my colleagues uh, for a few things. I think even if we change the theme for next year, we won't change the format because, believe me, you'd rather listen to each of us mix it up and then listen to me talk for an hour. So uh, those are some great stories. And, and tonight you heard about some of the, the great accomplishments of the last year, as well as some inspiring people and organizations throughout our community that are working hard to make Redwood City a special place. Uh, Redwood City is a special place for a lot of reasons, and it's not the, the buildings or the physical infrastructure. You didn't hear anything about that tonight. It is the people, and we are a diverse group of people. Um, we celebrate our diversity. We see it as a strength. And even though we have our differences in the community, we're united by our love for this special place that we call home. In government, we're working hard to try to become a model for how government can and should work. And I would say that that is more important than ever these days. This is the level where you can make a difference and where government can be a good uh, force in people's lives. Everyone, everyone in this room, everybody watching on TV, everybody in the community has a role to play in helping build that. We've strengthened our neighborhood associations and continue to incorporate them in the way that we do business. We are working with each of our boards, committees, and commissions to develop annual work plans that align with the council's strategic priorities, which you just heard about, and align with the council's vision and strategy going forward. We're becoming more efficient. Just last week, we interviewed the best group of candidates, the best group of volunteer candidates that I have seen in my entire time on the council. So that tells me that we have a, a really uh, great group of community members who are super engaged right now and really want to help the city. The state of the city is not just about this organization that we call the city of Redwood City. It's about the broader community. It's about everyone who's doing well, and it's about everybody who's struggling. And we all must work together. The state of the city is about what our business community does to help people in Redwood City. It's about our nonprofits who are key partners for us in helping those who need help. It's about our faith communities. These are not, uh, the, there's no shortage of ways that residents can get involved. Uh, we heard somebody allude to the fact that it's very easy to sit behind your computer and say things. It's harder when you actually get involved in the community. But we need your help. The state of the city is a matrix of intertwining challenges and opportunities, and it takes all of us working together to navigate through those challenges and opportunities. In conclusion, the state of the city depends on you. It is you who give me my unwavering optimism about our future. Let's continue to work together to make Redwood City the best it can be. Thank you. And with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.